and we're going to look at some advice Paul gave. But I want to ask you, have you ever got good advice before? Have you ever got great advice? I remember back when I was in high school, I used to be on what's called uh, academic teams. I don't know if they have academic teams in, at high schools now. Basically, you get together, and, and uh, uh, when we did it, we had four different areas. We had, we had mathematics tests, history tests, uh, um, science tests, and English tests. And yes, kids actually gathered after school to take more tests. And But it would be one school versus another, and we'd all take tests, and we'd have what's called quick recall. You'd get together and be the first team to buzz in and answer questions. And I was on one of those academic teams. I actually was involved in two of them. I took tests for history and mathematics. And I know, a strange combination is history and mathematics. But um, we had a guy who was in our group, one of my best friends, who uh, was basically on the mathematics. And this guy was unreal when it came to math. Give you an example. Go ahead and put the next slide on, Sam. You see pi right there. Here's it out to about you know, 20, 30 spots. You could walk up to him and ask what pi was. And you could see him thinking in his head, and he'd just start ringing off those numbers, one, four, one, five, nine. Just, just he'd go twenty or thirty spots without blinking. It was unreal. This guy could do math better than anybody else I'd ever, I'd ever seen. And he was talking with somebody, one of the people in our group that took tests, and um, one of the guys asked him for advice. How do you do so well on these tests? And he said, well, there's something I, I do every time before I take the test. And, and everybody's coming to him, what are you doing? What's going on? How do you do so well? And they asked him about four or five times. And he kind of waited. And I think he did this on purpose so he'd really have their attention. And finally, he just said, okay, before I sit down and take that test, I pray. some great advice to pray and of course it blew some of them away because they weren't believers and I thought what a wonderful way to share the faith I wouldn't have thought of that in high school time but that's what he did that was great advice Paul Give some good advice at the end of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he's giving his final thoughts. He's talking about remembering this person, remember that person, and he's going through, he's just wrapping up the letter. But there's two verses in there that he gives some just awesome advice. And it's found in verses 13 and 14 of 1 Corinthians 16. And here it is. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. These two verses give some wonderful advice. And these verses weren't limited to relationships, but I want to talk about them in regards with relationships, with marriage this morning, because this is some absolutely amazing advice that we can use. So let's start at the beginning. Be on your guard. We have to guard our hearts. We have to be vigilant over our hearts because they can be led astray so easy. We have to be vigilant or guarding our thinking because we can easily become so negative and defeated. We have to guard against our enemy, the devil, because he's seeking to destroy our relationships 
and hoping to destroy us as well. We have to be on guard. We always have to be watching. Not necessarily with just relationships, but with everything. We have to be on guard. 1 Peter 5 eight says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Satan's going to use anything. And if he can use our relationships, our marriage, to get us, don't put it past him. He will. And if it causes us to slow down and not serve God like we should, all right. If it causes us to fall away from our faith, he's thinking even better. He does not want us serving God. And if he can get through us, get to us through our relationships, he will. We have to keep watch. Because this world is changing so much and is moving further and further away from God. Moving further and further away from God's ideas of what marriage and what relationships is. I, I read something interesting the other day. Um, I flipped through and saw this on a couple different websites, but I stopped and looked at it on, uh, uh, on one website because the, the title just kind of, I thought, okay, that's interesting. And it was an article about Scarlett Johansson, a uh, movie star, a uh, popular movie star, who the title was ScarJo, No Monogamy. I thought, okay. So I clicked and looked, and she said, I don't think it's natural to be a monogamous person. I might be skewered for that, but I think it's work. It's a lot of work. And she goes on to say that she doesn't think monogamy works because everybody has such a hard time with it. And so she thinks because everybody has a hard time with it that that, that isn't what we're, that's not supposed to be the natural way. That whole thing, she had one thing right. Relationships are hard work. Relationships are hard work. And just because it's hard work doesn't mean that we shouldn't be committed. Committed to our spouse. In James chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, he writes this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's easier not to be... It's easier to sleep around because it's temptation. It's sin. I said in Sunday school earlier today, it wouldn't be tempting if, you know, it wouldn't be sin if it wasn't tempting. So people think that's easy. But we must stand guard. If we give in to sin, we know the ramifications of it. Paul writes, sin leads to death. And in terms of our relationship, it will lead to destruction. So we have to work. And we should work. Our marriages are good, wonderful, and rewarding. So we must stand on guard and avoid temptation. But that means we've got to have the right mindset. We don't just go along with whatever culture says. We stand strong in the word. And our foundation should be in God's word. I mean, we have.
have two choices. We can give in to the lie and be deceived and deceive ourselves thinking everything is okay this way. Or we can go against the grain and live in the truth. I always think it's great when we're fighting temptations to have Scripture in mind. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to memorize Scripture. If you don't know a lot of Scripture, okay, learn what you can. If you're not great at memorizing, learn. It's not a contest. You don't get an extra 10,000 points if you memorize everything, but it'd be great if you knew everything, if you knew the entire Bible. Learn. Take the time. Start learning Scripture. For example, when we're being tempted in that way, I think of passages like 2 Timothy 2.22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We must be prepared because Satan will deceive us. And it's not going to be like Satan standing in front of us going, hey, wait a second, I'm about to tempt you right now. He'll get us when we're not expecting it. He'll get us when we're not prepared, not looking. And that means we should always be on guard. Have God's word in our heart, in our mind. Second, we must stand firm in the faith. In order for our marriages to stay strong, we must stand firm in the in the faith. Isaiah thirty two eight tells us, "He who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands." It's one thing to know the word; it's another to apply it. Once read this old story a long time ago about this guy who was imprisoned. And and it was a very long time ago. He was imprisoned in uh, a cave. And uh, he was given, he was basically solitary confinement, and he was given one thing, a Bible. So if you're stuck in a cave, and the only thing you have to look at is a Bible, you're going to look at a Bible. Now, after he died, people went in to see what he had looked at. And they saw writing all over the cave wall. You know, maybe it would be verses that he had read and maybe grew in the faith and, or, or something. But there were things written on the wall. Things like Psalm 119 is the middle of the Bible. Or he'd write down what the longest verse is, right? What the shortest verse is. More of a hobby. To know the Word of God is one thing. But we've got to do more than just know, we've got to apply it. It's got to be applied in our lives. And thus we must stand firm in the faith. And with our relationships, that's so different. Our relationships must be standing firm in the faith. In his book, Sacred Marriage, Gary Thomas wrote, he goes, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? Think about that for a second. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? The best thing we can do for our spouse is make sure we are right with God. Is to make sure we have a relationship with God. Jesus Christ should be the central focus of our marriage. So let me ask what's your foundation? What's your cornerstone? It's not Christ, it's not solid enough. Foundation of our marriages should be based on Christ. And through God's word, there is a solid plan for us to follow, a solid foundation for us to stand on. 
And unfortunately, many people aren't. And many marriages crumble. I notice a lot of times people get, um, their foundation moves away from fact and truth and moves to feelings. Feelings are okay, wonderful to have, but we don't base our life only on feelings. For example, people mistake lust for love. Many people try to manage their marriages by feelings alone. And sometimes they avoid confrontations because they don't want to feel uncomfortable. Listen, our faith must be bigger than our fears and our feelings. Our faith must be stronger because our marriage Our marriages are about glorifying and honoring God. Our marriages are about being holy and sanctified. Our marriages is about seeking God's will and glorifying Him as a couple, not just individually. And if we're not standing firm in the faith, we are just opening the door for Satan to come in and attack and destroy our marriage, our relationships. And he will try to sneak in. As we know, John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Satan will try to destroy our marriage. But God has a wonderful plan. I love these words from Francis Chan in his book, You and Me Forever, and he said, Draw close to him and let your marriage be the overflow of that. When things are right with God, your marriage can actually become what it was designed to be. Peace comes when both parties come to an agreement. Agree on God. Agree on his holiness and the supremacy he deserves in your lives. Isn't it interesting how he talks about peace here? when we're committed to God and following Him. We're talked in Sunday school about being a church member and unity in the church, and what do we talk about? Peace and love. There's a connection there when it comes to relationships. We must stand firm in the faith. And we must also be men of courage. Be men of courage. We all must be courageous. As I said before, knowing what is right and applying it are two different things. Courage is being willing to apply what his word says. Courage is doing what is right even when it's not popular even when our spouses may disagree with us. We must have courage and remember we are not alone in this. God is with us. Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God will help us through these situations. But we must seek his wisdom and understanding. We must seek his guidance. Listen, it takes courage to confront our loved ones if something wrong is happening. It also takes courage to be willing to listen when we're the one doing wrong and they're confronting us. It goes both ways in a marriage. It takes courage and guts to say no to things that you think would make you happy when God is shutting those doors and saying, no, not right now. To put it simply, it takes courage to do what's right. It takes courage to do what's right. 
Because, let's be honest, a lot of people's marriage problems aren't marriage problems. They're God problems. And we want to do what we want instead of what God commands us to do. It traces back to our relationship, really more of our lack of relationship that we have with God. We want a healthy marriage. We need to have a healthy relationship with the Savior. We must have courage to communicate with our spouse. And if we're not willing to talk with them, how much do we really love them then? If we're not willing to talk with them about what's going on in our lives. We have to be open with our spouse and be united. So my question is, are we willing to humble ourselves and be courageous? And I don't say that as a pat on the back. It's not meant to be a pat on the back. We don't get a pat on the back for just doing what we're supposed to be doing. Follow God's counsel, and he'll help us through every step of the way. We must have courage. We also must be strong. Our fourth point this morning, be strong. In our relationship, we need to be strong. We need to be strong enough to forgive. We need to be strong enough to strengthen and pursue intimacy with our spouse. We need to be strong to persevere through the hard times. And I know that seems like a lot. Satan knows our weaknesses. He knows how to get us. He's going to use everything he can. We've got to be strong. Even at our strongest, we're still weak. Even at our strongest, we're still weak. We've got to find our strength in God. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Ephesians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We find our strength in him, the guy who spoke and created the universe. The guy who destroyed the world through a flood. The guy who will one day give judgment on us. The guy that knows every part of us. He's the guy we lean on. He's the one we lean on through any and every struggle, relationship, or whatever it is. We stand strong in him. And finally this morning, one more piece of advice from Paul. Do everything in love. Boy, doesn't that sum it up? Do everything in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never fails. Whenever we speak, we should be motivated by love. What we say is meant for healing and not harming. When we serve, it's for the other's good. It's not to manipulate or cause them to have debt on from us or to us. If we confront, it's only out of love. It's not to show that we're better or it's not to condemn or judge, but it's to pick up our spouse. 
and when we sin and hurt our spouse, because we will. We go back to them and seek reconciliation. We humble ourselves and seek reconciliation. We admit our wrong. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, says this. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together, in perfect harmony. If we live with this mindset in the midst of love, God's love, our attitude will be different, our lives will be different, our relationships will be different. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. When we open our hearts to God's love and are willing to share that, we will grow. Because as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, love never fails. It will change us completely. So we must do everything in love. And our spouse, our children, our family, our friends, whoever, will see God working in our lives. So let God work in your life. Make sure your relationship is a God-centered relationship. Let God be first, number one in your marriage. Number one. And remember these words. As I have the worship team come up, remember these words. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything. We've been talking about relationships this morning. I want to close with just this. The greatest relationship we can have is with our Father through our son's sacrifice, through his son's sacrifice. God wants us to be a part of his family. But to do that, we must give ourselves to him. If you don't know Jesus, we offer a time of invitation, a time that we can, you can come forward, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, start repenting of your ways, be baptized in these waters, start a new walk, be a part of his family, start a relationship with him. You can do that today. Why don't you do that as we sing this song of invitation this morning? Please stand.